This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Chapter 3 is relatively short and deals with the, with the phenomenon of globalisation. And the chapter very much follows on from international trade in Chapter 2. So globalisation is defined as the process by which uh, the countries and businesses throughout the world are becoming increasingly interconnected because of increased trade. And we know that. We said this in the last chapter. Uh, many more imports, exports, uh, many more uh, uh, companies deciding to perhaps manufacture, maybe close to their markets, or maybe manufacturing where labour costs are low. Globalisation has increased very much the production of goods and services. The goods and services are perhaps made more cheaply, perhaps they're made better, perhaps they're made locally to the markets and therefore uh, uh, are, are more readily available to those markets. And of course many of the biggest companies in the world are multinational companies with subsidiaries all over the place uh, and very much making use of the idea of globalisation. You have to think of world dominating companies like Ford and Toyota <coughs> and Nissan. Think of <coughs> Lenovo and Apple and Samsung in terms of uh, IT. Uh, think of uh, service companies like uh, PwC or KPMG. Uh, these all operate on vast international uh, uh, scales. Now the causes of globalisation, first of all, or perhaps an enabler rather than a cause, but once it's enabled it can become a cause, that there is much better communication. If you're going to spread yourself into many countries throughout the world, you need communication, both of ideas and data, uh, to properly coordinate uh, what's going on. But also you need physical communication. Uh, you need to be able to send managers, perhaps abroad, to uh, spend some time at an overseas manufacturing plant or to supervise or to liaise in some way. And of course, international travel by air has become uh, essentially very uh, convenient and much cheaper than it used to be. There are growing political alliances, for example, the European Union. Had the European Union effectively wanted free, free movement of goods and people and capital, uh, and this would naturally lead uh, to much greater uh, globalisation within certainly the EU. Outside the EU, the greater bargaining power of the EU uh, has probably enabled the EU uh, to uh, uh, become itself part of the wider globalisation uh, uh, network uh, and to have better uh, uh, chances at uh, exporting to uh, remote markets. The growth of global industries, as I've said, uh, companies like Apple, Lenovo, Ford, Toyota, uh, large uh, petrol companies like BP and Texaco and so on, uh, operating on a global scale. Cost differentials, we've mentioned this already, one of the reasons for uh, trading abroad is to perhaps manufacture uh, many of your goods in a low-cost environment. And then there are wider trade agreements that are allowing the freer movement of goods and money and people. These trade agreements uh, try to reduce uh, tariffs and quotas uh, to encourage the, the free interchange of goods. Because it is uh, widely, belie widely believed by economists that open borders uh, is, is good for everyone eventually, and protectionism, where everyone closes down the border, you can only buy the goods at a mate or if you're buying imported goods are terribly expensive, or you, you're not allowed to import goods where there's perhaps relative or comparative advantage enjoyed by the manufacturing country, uh, in the long term that this is going to be best for everyone. The various trading patterns you can have, well, you can make in only one location at home and export production. Uh, the example given in the notes, I think, is Boeing. Boeing only makes aircraft in the United States and exports them everywhere. You can manufacture almost all your products abroad 
uh, and then the, the product is sent through uh, the world. Uh, for example, Apple. Apple designs its products in the United States, but essentially its products are manufactured or assembled in the Far East. Uh, and that is done principally to get cost advantages uh, through, through labour and the infrastructure which is available there. The process of sending manufacturing abroad is called offshoring. Uh, and this is uh, one of the areas which is kind of controversial. You send jobs abroad, basically. It leaves some people at home without jobs. Uh, and this has caused some countries or some politicians to uh, try to uh, arrange for re the, the repatriation of jobs, even though it's liable to make the goods more expensive. You can set up, uh, uh, you can be, have your head office in one country and you can set up manufacturing uh, uh, plants in uh, other countries, particularly those uh, close to markets. This is uh, commonly done with uh, products like beer or Coca-Cola. There isn't much point in making all Coca-Cola in Atlanta and then kind of sending tankers throughout the world with what is uh, probably 95% water. Much better to manufacture that abroad uh, and the transport costs are much, much lower. And then uh, we have uh, uh, manufacturing or s uh, subcontracting and licensing as an alternative to manufacturing. You don't set up your own uh, uh, factory abroad, but what you do is you find a local producer and you license them to make your product. Of course, it has to be according to your specifications uh, and you will want to inspect the product. You don't want your trade name to be tarnished in any way uh, because this uh, uh, person who's making your product is cutting corners or hasn't got the right quality. Uh, licensing uh, allows uh, people to make and sell goods to make use of a, uh, a trade name and the, uh, the the owner of the license if you like or the owner of the, 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 the patent if you like uh, can take a royalty. It's a very safe quick way of expanding internationally don't set up your own factory, license somebody else to make and market the product uh, and take a percentage of that. Uh, and you're exposing yourself to very little risk indeed. Potential problems uh, of globalization. Again, we've, we've kind of mentioned these uh, before, perhaps the export of jobs. I won't go through that again. Uh, the crushing of local industries by powerful multinationals. And it has to be said, there are people who uh, vehemently disagree with the process of globalization. They say this is really meaning that everybody ends up with the same kind of product and the same kind of specifications and so on. It, it means that local uh, producers who made perfectly fine items, maybe in many ways better items uh, than the international producers were, were making, are nevertheless swamped, maybe because of the economies of scale and the huge spending power that these large companies have. Uh, and you lose uh, the, 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 the heterogeneity of the products. Everything ends up being rather the same and choice is diminished. Along similar sort of lines, there is also the idea that some of these very large companies are much richer than, than many countries are. Uh, uh, Apple, for example, uh, if it was a country, it is well up the list of rich countries, if you like, in, in terms of its revenue. And some people uh, worry a little bit. You know, this very powerful company with very, very high spending power comes in uh, and, you know, we can promise to do something in a particular country. And the government kind of caves in uh, because the, the company has this sort of economic power and the government has that sort of economic power. And some people feel that this, these very large companies uh, undermine democracy. Trade agreements. Again, we've mentioned this a little bit. They are treaties, agreements between countries on the reciprocal arrangements for tariffs and quotas and indeed tactical standards of the products uh, to reduce the barriers to trade. Uh, so maybe for all cars, there is a, a trade agreement that the tariff might be kept at 10% both ways and so on. 
they will have a certain commonality, maybe on emissions, uh, how good the lights have to be, how good the brakes have to be, and so on. Uh, and, and this allows goods to be transferred between countries with very little impediment arising from, say, customs inspections and the like. Examples include the European Union, the European Free Trade Area, that's slightly bigger than the EU, and the North American Free Trade uh, Agreement, uh, which involves or involves uh, Mexico, uh, United States and Canada. Uh, of course, sometimes politicians want to pull the rug from under these, particularly those who favour protectionism. And then there is an organisation called the World, World Trade Organisation. They have kind of default rules and regulations uh, about fair trade and tariffs and quotas and so on. These can be overridden uh, by uh, specific uh, 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 trade agreements. Uh, but the World Trade Organization also hopes to uh, arbitrate companies between countries that are in dispute and, and overall to try to encourage imports, exports, free movement of goods uh, throughout the world. Pastel. If a company is thinking of beginning to trade abroad or uh, manufacturing abroad or simply exporting abroad, uh, it, it has to consider what the really the, the 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 risks might be, what the benefits might be, in, in expanding outwards like that. And PESTEL is uh, an acronym used uh, just to remind us of the sort of considerations that we ought to have. So the P in PESTEL stands for political. If you're going to be setting up a manufacturing plant in a country. Uh, you need to bear in mind, perhaps, the politics. Uh, is the uh, government stable? Is the political system stable? Or is it a system where the dictator, perhaps, who's in charge, uh, simply uh, really appropriates company property and says, this is now nationalised and I'm sorry, uh, there's going to be no compensation for that. Even if it's not as uh, drastic as that, you have to think, well, Maybe there's an election coming up in three years. Uh, the new government gets in, is a government which is looks as though, or the government that might get in, looks as though it might be a government that doesn't favour government spending. It's going to cut back on roads and rail and other infrastructure uh, projects. And here we are, we're a, a, a large engineering company. Does it make sense to uh, open a branch in that country where there's this risk of a political change, which will change the government's view on public spending. Economic. Uh, a bad time to expand is if you think a country is in economic decline, if it's in one of these uh, adverse parts of the trade cycle there. Uh, you'd open your factory only to find that the, uh, the products aren't going to be selling very well. It might also be a bad time to expand if the interest rates in that country were particularly high. Where you want to expand is maybe where we're in a trough and we see that there's a, the chance of the, uh, the country coming up out of this uh, depression into a period of boom, maybe where interest rates are low for a little while, inflation is low and so on. Social. You have to think of the, uh, the social repercussions uh, or, or, or the social preferences of opening in a particular country. Uh, big social influences that we have at the, the moment uh, is in many Western countries, certainly, uh, the way the population is changing, where there's a higher and higher po population proportion of elderly people and a relatively uh, lower proportion of younger people. And depending on the sort of business you're in, that could be good news or bad news. If you're in pharmaceuticals, the ageing population that you might find in a country is good news because older people consume more medicines than younger people. If, however, you were in education, in schools, in school textbooks and so on, uh, then you might discover that uh, going into a country with a very low birth rate means that the market for your school textbooks is relatively low and has got no signs of growing. You have to also be aware of the culture which in these organisations 
will they like what you're doing? Will will they uh, uh, feel uh, that that what you're doing is useful to them? It fits their needs and so on, or is it something which is really far too alien to them? Technological changes. Uh, in uh, technological changes, the uh, internet has been one of the most uh, uh, marked uh, change of the last twenty years, and so. The amount of knowledge which is available over the internet, the way people can shop around very easily for the best price and, and, and so on, uh, has made great technological changes. But we also have to look elsewhere. Uh, we maybe have to look at, uh, say, improvements in the efficiency of airline jet engines and so on. Uh, this can uh, greatly affect uh, your success in trading. If you're jet engine is 20% more efficient than somebody else's jet engine, then then you can probably begin exporting that country very well. But if it's the other way around, then you're going to be in some, some difficulty with these technological changes. Ecology. Uh, you have to be uh, uh, aware of the rules and regulations uh, regarding the protection of the environment in a country in which you might be trading. Uh, so if you were beginning to trade in, uh, let's say, Germany or some of the Scandinavian uh, countries, uh, they have long had very, what you might call, green policies, uh, and they may d dislike, uh, or you may have to take special steps to make sure that a factory you erect in one of these countries is compliant with their rules and regulations. But ecology also comes in el elsewhere. Uh, some people would say it doesn't matter how efficient your jet engines are, they're still doing damage. Uh, there, there's also the idea of the, the kind of transportation miles that, that products do. If you make something in Brazil and you have to ship it across to Europe, uh, there are several thousand miles there uh, uh, that's consuming fuel in the tankers or the aeroplanes and so on. Uh, and some people have a deliberate policy that they would rather buy locally uh, to save on greenhouse gases and reduce the carbon footprints and so on. And finally, there's legal legal uh, changes. Uh, comes to some extent also under political, because the politicians usually make the laws. Uh, but you have to uh, see, is it actually legal for me to trade in that country or to try to sell the products I'm making in that country? Uh, so if you're going to get into legal uh, uh, difficulties, then it might be better to, to stay away or, 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 or at least do a lot of homework to see whether or not getting through this, this, these, these steps, these difficult steps to get legal compliance is going to make it worthwhile.